Here's part two of our video lecture for chapter 10, where we're going to continue calculating a partner's basis in his or her partnership interests. Now, back in part one, we had learned about calculating the beginning or the initial basis of a partner when he or she contributes assets into forming a new partnership. And you can see here now there's additional adjustments we're going to be making throughout the year to calculate the basis at the end of the year. But as a review, remember we have a partner who's going to be contributing some type of asset to the partnership. Maybe this asset is a building or land that has a basis to that partner, a cost basis probably, and it's being transferred to the partnership. So now the partnership has this asset, basically with that same basis. But the partner is getting back in exchange another asset, and that asset is a partnership interest in the new partnership. And the partner's basis in this new asset is going to be the same generally basis of the old asset that was transferred into the partnership. Sometimes we call this basis from the partner to the partnership. We call that transfer basis. And here when we exchange assets, like this real estate maybe, for a partnership interest, this basis carries over, or a substitute basis. Okay, so that's the initial basis we're working with. And then if the partner makes additional contributions into the partnership, that's going to be added to the partner's basis. And of course, the simplest thing that can be contributed would be cash. Contributing a dollar in cash to the partnership would increase the partner's basis by a dollar. Now, just the opposite would be if the partner takes money out of the partnership, cash distributions or non-cash distributions going to the partner. And here you can see that's going to reduce the partner's basis. These distributions generally are tax-free to the extent we have some type of basis down here. The basis cannot go below zero. So in other words, as long as you have basis, that means you can take out money, you can take out other assets, generally tax-free. So that's why calculating this basis is so important. Also, eventually if the partner retires, either redeeming his or her partnership interest to the partnership or selling it to another person, an existing or incoming partner, what the retiring partner can do is subtract out any remaining basis they have in calculating the sale of this partnership interest. Now, the main way you want to increase a partner's basis is because the partnership is profitable and that partner has to report his or her share of the partnership income on their own uh, individual return. And there's two groups of income. Here's something called net ordinary income. Again, the partner's going to pay tax on that. So we're going to increase the partner's basis by that same amount. Now, this is not money. This is not cash going to the partner. Distributions are cash going to the partner. All this does is increase the partner's basis because the partner has to report this as taxable income. Now, there's probably some other types of income here mentioned as capital gains and other income that the partner has to also report on his or her own tax return, and then that's going to increase again the partner's basis. Now, the opposite of these two here are these two that are subtracted from the partner's basis. In other words, if the partnership has a loss, the partner is going to deduct that loss on his or her tax return. Here are some other losses or deductions. And they also reduce. We subtract this out to get the partner's basis. 
And then the last thing that affects a partner's basis is changes to the partnership liability that this partner may be liable for. So if the partnership owes more money during the year, that increase is going to be increasing the partner's basis. If the partnership pays down its liabilities during the year, then the partner has less at risk, less possible economic loss, and that's going to reduce the partner's basis. Again, so we're adding and subtracting things throughout the year to get a updated partnership basis to the partner. Again, this is the amount that eventually can be taken out as distributions paid to the partner and also deducting losses here on the partnership return. Again, you cannot reduce the basis below zero. If you're making distributions with the basis below zero, then possibly that's taxable uh, distributions. If you have losses more than the basis, where it's already zero, the, the basis is zero, you got to suspend the loss to a future year until there is basis for that partner's interest. Okay, so let's go through a simple example here. We have two partners forming a partnership. So we have Suresh contributing an asset that has a value of 150000 but the cost basis to that partner is only seventy. So now this basis will uh, go into the uh, basis of his or her partnership interest. Also during the year, the partnership borrowed money. It was zero before. Now it's up a hundred thirty thousand more. They owe the partnership owes, and this is going to go increasing the partner's basis. The partnership has income during the year, and the partner is going to share in that income, increasing the partner's basis. So the basis Shares has in the partnership interest is the initial contribution, here equal to the basis of whatever asset was contributed into the partnership. And here, half of the liabilities of the partnership, because if something goes wrong in the partnership, the partners are liable, at least for their share, in this case, 50% worth. And here is half the income that is going to be taxable to our partner. Now, keep in mind, this is not money going to the partner. All we're doing here is calculating the partner's basis, now totaling 156000 This is the amount the partner can take out tax-free as a distribution. Or this is the amount eventually the partner can deduct if there's losses to be reported to the partner. Or if the partner sells his or her interest, this is the amount they can deduct the basis. We've said before that partnerships are a flow-through or pass-through entity, so they don't pay any income taxes on their profit. But we allocate it to the partners. Yeah? So this is the form we're going to see probably in the Part 3 video, Form 1065. And to report to each partner how much income, how much deductions, how much drawings they receive, distributions they receive during the year. We're going to prepare a Schedule K-1 for each partner, which is going to be part of this 1065 form. We're going to see income and expenses. Income and losses are going to be divided up into two broad groups. One is called ordinary business income or business loss. This is going to be the first page of, the, of that form 1065. And then any other income or expense not included in this group here, again called ordinary income or loss, are going to be separately stated things like charitable deductions, interest income, capital gains and losses, because these amounts, be they income or deductions, have certain limitations to the owner, in this case to the partners. We cannot group everything into this figure up here. Yeah, so we're going to have to individually report all of these items. 
So each partner now knows the dollar amount they have to uh, utilize in any special calculation on their individual return. Once again, the basis of a partnership's interest cannot go below zero. And if you have losses, uh, still after a zero basis, the losses are going to be carried forward to future years when there's additional basis, be it through additional contributions, or better yet, if there's additional income to report, and then that loss may be, be released in that future year. So making distributions during the year, again, are generally tax-free as long as the partner has basis in his or her partnership interest, and it's going to reduce that basis. Now, once the basis reaches zero and you still give distributions to the partner, probably anything um, after that is going to be treated as a, a capital gain generally. Yeah? But again, you cannot reduce the basis below zero. Now, partners cannot be treated as employees of their own partnership. But what you can do is pay them something called a guaranteed payment. So let's go through an example here. So here's a partner, and here's our partnership. And because this is such a hardworking partner, what we're going to do is pay them almost like a salary. But again, you're not going to treat them as an employee. You don't issue out W-2 forms. What you're going to call this is a guaranteed payment. So when you calculate out now the profit for the partnership, so here's all the money they made during the year revenue, and here's all the deductions they incurred during the year. One of these deductions is this guaranteed payment you're going to subtract out here to get the partnership's uh, net income or or, or loss. So now the partner is going to report their share of this net income on their individual return. And this guaranteed payment is also going to be reported to the partner as partnership income. So the partnership guaranteed payment, this guaranteed payment here, shows up a couple different places. One's as a payment to the partner, taxable to the, that partner. And again, as a deduction to calculate the whole partnership income in which that partner will share with other partners. We've seen this topic before, probably back in Chapter 3, where an owner of a business has transactions with family members or with other businesses they control. So generally, if you incur a loss, generally if you're trying to possibly get a better deduction versus maybe a capital gain but by reported by a related person, there's going to be a limitation or disallowance of that loss or expense. So you can go back to Chapter 3, I believe it's called Section uh, 267, uh, Deduction or Loss Limitations. So one of the benefits of a partnership where things flow through to the owners, to the partners, is that they get to deduct any losses incurred by the partnership. But the losses may be limited to the extent of something we've seen before called at-risk limitations. Basically here in our current chapter for partnerships, this is equal to the partner's basis in his or her partnership interests. So here, for example, you can see that initial basis um, that for contributions that the partner put in, plus any liabilities liabilities that the partner is, is uh, liable for, is at risk for. Here we call that type of liabilities recourse liabilities, yeah, recourse debt versus non-recourse, where the partners are not liable. For example, for most uh, limited liability companies, the LLC will shield the member owner from liability. So those liabilities are considered to be non-recourse. 
And of course, we know that if there's income from the partnership, it's allocated to the partner. So basically, these are all the things that will increase the partnership's basis. This is to the extent now how much the partner can take out as distributions. And this is the amount to the extent the partner can take uh, losses allocated from the partnership. Again, that's at-risk limitations, limiting the amount of deductions. Now, if you allocated more loss than what's at risk, you have to wait and suspend the loss and again carry it over to a future year when you do have at risk uh, amounts. Okay, let's talk about one more topic. At the very end, well, some in, in chapter 10, we have this form called a 1099K. Um, being presented. I'm not sure why they did it in this chapter, but possibly because it's related to people that have their own business, including partnerships. So companies like PayPal, maybe eBay, even Uber, Lyft, um, Airbnb, they're processing payments to its members. Now, they're not selling stuff to um, their members. They're just processing uh, payments. And if the payments number more than 200 a year or $20,000 per year, then companies like these have to issue out this relatively new form called a 1099K. So if you take a look at that, Again, if the number of transactions exceed 200 for the year or the payments made to that uh, person was more than 20,000 during the year, a company like um, PayPal has to issue out this form to the payee, its member, like uh, an Uber driver. Again, the customer would be making the actual payment, but Uber is processing the payment and a copy of this form is going to go to that driver and they have to report this amount of income on their tax return as business income. And of course, a copy of this will also go to the IRS. A similar type form, at least for 2019 and earlier, is this one called a 1099 miscellaneous. And most times it's this box here where payments have been made usually more than $600 per year to the taxpayer. And now the taxpayer has to report this dollar amount on their return, possibly a Schedule C like we learned back in Chapter 3, or possibly now in this current chapter for a partnership. Okay. Now, when the number is in here, the dollar amount is in here, not only is this income subject to income tax, federal and state, but also subject to uh, self-employment taxes, that Social Security and Medicare tax that is um, tacked on to self-employed taxpayers. Beginning 2020, they're going to take this amount reported on the Form 1099 miscellaneous and now create a new form called 1099 Non-Employee Compensation where here is the total dollar amount paid by one business to another business. Again, that Schedule 1099 or Form 1099K is by people that process transactions, not necessarily the seller. But here is the, the seller, one business selling or paying another business, this non-employee compensation amount. Withholdings is not something you can elect. It's by default if you don't provide the uh, seller your social security number or ID number. By default, they're going to hold back, they call this backup withholding, probably 24% uh, taxes. Yeah. So again, these are forms introduced to us here in our current chapter 10. Okay, let's stop here. And then in one more video, I'm going to uh, show you the 1065 partnership tax return form.